All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 28th day of October, Saturday. The Sabbath in Israel, <clears throat> have they rested from their actions? I don't think so. Doesn't the Israeli military rest on the, uh, on the Sabbath from offensive actions? Apparently not. Not very Orthodox Jews, are they? Uh, yeah, uh, the 28th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2023. The year of our Lord, yes. Uh, I'm a person that's driven to understand things. I mean, if I don't understand something, I will grab a hold of it until I do. It's like Calvinism. It's like dispensationalism. I'm still working on God. <laughs> I, I, that, I'm going to hold on to him for a long time, I think, because it's not going to be uh, something. He's, I can grasp a hold of him, but I can't thoroughly grasp him. Um, all right. Uh, enough nonsense there. But I was considering what's going on in Israel. How how do you solve this mess? What is the root of this problem? Why are Jewish people the way they are? Why are Muslim people the way they are? Uh, and first of all, let me talk about Islam. There is a supremacist element in Islam, but it is a religious supremacy. It is not a identity supremacy. There is no racist element, or it's not supposed to be a racist element, in Islam. You could be Nordic and be a Muslim. You could be Asian and be a Muslim. Of course, there's Muslims all over the world. The biggest Muslim country in the world is, what is it, Malaysia, isn't it? Down there in Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, that's a very concentrated area of Muslims. And they didn't achieve that by conquest. They achieved that by trade and evangelism, uh, except it's not really the gospel. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's a, a certain element in that. Um, Islam is not utterly intolerant, and it depends on how it's applied to. Uh, under the Ottomans, at least in the 20th century... <laughs> In the 19th century, uh, Christians and Jews could, could live relatively peaceably uh, as a second class, definitely not uh, equal with Muslims. Uh, it, it, Christians are not equal with Muslims under Islam, nor are Jews. Uh, pagans, well, they can't exist under Islam. Uh, not a traditional Quranic Islam, at least, or fundamentalist Islam. Uh <clears throat> Christians and Jews have a certain, uh, with Christians having a little bit better position uh, under uh, is, uh, fundamentalist Islam because we are people of the book. And uh, they recognize Jesus as a great prophet, maybe the greatest prophet, depending, but just not the last prophet. Uh, and indeed, they recognize that Jesus is coming back. And But it's, it's a pretty distorted picture there. But as I was thinking about this, what about Israel? Well, you know, eventually the pieces fit together. What's going on now in the land that Israel calls Israel, the, the Jewish people, the Jewish people that inhabit it call Israel, the, the Zionist uh, homeland, that's the problem. That's the problem. Their, their religion combined with an ideology of Zionism is the problem. Um, let me show you some scripture first. Now, it also is rooted in the Old Testament, but the Old Testament was not permanent. It was not eternal. It was only temporary until Messiah came, and Messiah has come. 
And if they had recognized that, the majority of them, the, uh, many Jews did recognize that Jesus was the Messiah. But some didn't. And then with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, uh, Old Testament Judaism was wiped out because without the temple, there, you cannot keep the law of Moses. You can't uh, try to keep the law of Moses. Nobody kept the law of Moses except Christ. But you can't even attempt to keep it because the temple is necessary. And so what Judaism became was uh, the Pharisees who had come into existence uh, during roughly two centuries prior to that time, uh, they had uh, developed a system that was separate from temple worship. It was separate from Old Testament uh, Israel. It was separate from the law. They had their own, what they call the oral Torah, the traditions of the elders, uh, which is supposed is like in Roman Catholicism. They have their tradition, which was they claim was handed down by Jesus and the apostles, but there's of course no written record of it. You could claim anything that was it was secret until until who knows when. Uh, they always claim it. Oh, we have this secret tradition. <laughs> well, you know when somebody does that, if it's secret, it's not from God. God doesn't do things like that. So, uh, but the Pharisees claimed a uh, Moses was given an oral Torah, and that was their traditions. Moses wasn't given any such thing. God declared the law completely in the Old Testament, and he said you're not to add to it or take away from it. The Jews, uh, the Pharisees didn't care. They just added to it, uh, supposedly to protect it. They expanded it. And then they found ways around it, around their, around their expansions. And, some, and that's where it's really silly and weird. If you read the Talmud today, which is a teaching of the Pharisees, basically expanded. It, they're, they're in the tradition that rabbinical Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, is the tradition of the Pharisees. So if you read about the Pharisees in the New Testament, you're reading about what is the remnants of Judaism today. There's also Reformed Judaism and you know liberalized Judaism, but they're they're like the liberal Christianity. Uh, they don't they're nothing. I mean they they don't have any authority at all. So uh, anyway, the the Old Testament law, uh, God set Israel. He chose Abraham. And through Abraham to bring forth the Messiah through a lineage, and that people uh, that were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were the uh, the means by which he brought about the Messiah. And God does things in context, including a historical context, which is what is completely different about the Bible than the Quran. There is no context in the Quran; it's just sayings from Allah. No context. Not God interacting with a people to provide a context to understand things. <laughs> uh, it is just, it's like the Proverbs. Uh, that, that would be probably a, an analogy from the Bible, although not the same content. If you look at the Proverbs, they really don't have a context. They're just a, a set of wise sayings, okay? Uh, and the Quran is like that. I don't think anybody can really contest that. <laughs> it's not really, uh, there's, there's hardly any history in there. Or it's... It's not set in a people and God's interacting with the people in the world like the Old Testament is. It's a completely different thing. And it's one author. Uh, and, of course, the Muslims say that author is Allah. We say the author of the Bible is God, too, but, you know, there's many different authors there. And it was Muhammad that dictated the Quran orally because— uh, or communicated orally because he was, he was illiterate. He could neither read nor write. So it was picked up by his disciples and eventually written down. All right, so here the problem is that Judaism, uh, to a much greater degree than Islam, has this exclusivistic mindset partially derived from the Old Testament because God set his people apart, his people Israel, the children of Jacob, the 12 tribes came from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in that lineage. And he was working with them 
and communicating through the law at Moses and then the prophets, and then finally sending the Messiah, the promised one that was promised to the world, not just to the Jews, but to the world in the beginning at the fall. The fall of Adam and Eve some 6,000 years ago. All right, so that that exclusivistic mindset that's present in there because he want, he needed to keep his people through whom the Messiah would come separate from the world. He didn't want them mingling in and becoming pagans. So they were supposed to be his people set apart to him for his special purpose. And that special purpose was fulfilled in Christ. And I will read some scripture to show you that. But, uh, so they have that from that, plus the, the Pharisees in the Talmud amplified that and turned it into a very sinful kind of attitude where Jewish people are not only uh, the chosen ones, which is dangerous. We see this same kind of corruption in certain forms of Christianity like Calvinism the elect, a, a mindset where you're chosen by God and nobody else is, so that makes you better than them. And you really don't care what happens to them because God created them to send to hell anyway. The ex in fact, exactly the same attitude that's present in the worst elements of Calvinism is present in the Talmud, the Jewish religious books of the uh, that are the Pharisees, the teaching of the Pharisees down through the centuries. It is an elitist, uh, it's not quite racial because you can be a Jew without being a, an actual descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's so it's, it, you can't, it's, but it, it is sort of racist. And that's where the problem comes in. They ha in the Talmud, you'll, you'll find, and I don't encourage you to read it. I really don't, because it, uh, unless you have God's love, it will stir up hatred toward the Jewish people. It will. <laughs> it, you, you, you see these things that, that it's saying. If you're not a Jew and you see what it's saying about you as a Gentile, you won't be happy. Okay, so I don't want to repeat that stuff uh, or give examples of it. If, if you have to look, you'll have to look for your, on your own. So there's no, there's no good purpose in trying to expose that. Just, just take my word for it. If you don't want to take my word, then you can dive in yourself. It's on in the Internet. It's online. No problem to dig into it. Other than... You might want to take a medication of some sort before you read it. Maybe blood pressure meds or tranquilizer or shot of bourbon, perhaps, <clears throat> to uh, calm your nervous system down because it's going to be agitated. So here's that. This is that's the real problem. And let's, so let's look at the scripture, and then I want to go into the exact cause. Uh, which is an extension of this whole thing, this, this, uh, this attitude that's present in the Jewish people. Not in all of them. I'm not accusing everyone of this. I'm generalizing. Of course, I'm generalizing. Uh, but I have noticed a definite coolness among Jewish people if they find out you're not a Jew— there's a definite coolness that appears almost instantly. Uh, at a, now, I, I was thinking back, and yeah, I was on a tour, and there was a, a nice young man my age, and we, were, we sort of went together, and we were talking. He was Jewish. He had his, his, uh, his uh, I forgot what you call that, the, the, the shirt with the tassels on the bottom, and, and we were talking, and we got along fine. Uh, so it's not universal. <clears throat> but we didn't get too into things theological either, and I didn't, you know, I was just there to, to, uh, to reconnoiter the land. But yeah, but he wasn't a believer in, in Christ, but he was, and I would say he was probably an Orthodox Jew, 
and uh, we got along fine. So this is not something that is universal, but uh, it generally is present. It certainly rears its head now and then, uh, more often now than then. So let's look at Scripture to start with. And this will explain some of it from a biblical point of view. I'm not the author here. This is the Apostle Paul, who was a Jew, who was a Pharisee, the Pharisee of Pharisees, he said. And he rejected all his learning, all his Pharisaical instruction as dung, because he just was discovered by Christ, the Messiah, Jesus. Yeshua HaMashiach got a hold of him and sent him out mostly to the Gentiles. So he wrote most of the New Testament, sort of. Depends how you measure it. He, he wrote more books or letters in the New Testament than anybody else. He didn't write a gospel. All right, so here's First Thessalonians, and Paul is writing here to uh, the church in Thessalonica, to a church that is Gentile. And I have to point out something here. The New King James is the Bible NKV here that I usually recommend to people. This particular verse, they deliberately obscured something, I think. They deviated from the King James. Uh, the, the, the NKV was published in 1982. It's supposed to be an update of the King James. But I think there was a reason for this that probably was related to some of them being dispensationalists. And they didn't want to, uh, or just progressives, shall we say. So I'll read the, uh, the traditional English version first, uh, King James. For ye, which is 1611, or this is actually 1769, but I'll do this, the top one. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, uh, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. So uh, uh, Christian, Jewish Christian churches, we date back to Jerusalem in the first century to approximately 30 or 33 AD, depending on when Jesus was actually crucified. And no, we don't know the exact year. They didn't use our calendar back then. For ye have suffered like things uh, of, of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, talking about persecution. They were persecuted in Thessalonica by their fellow Thessalonians. And here in the New King James, it says, as they did from the Judeans. Well, that's not a bad translation, but the word is actually Jews. <laughs> it doesn't, not the inhabitants of Judea, Jews. That's the word. They simply change that. Everybody else translates it as Jews. So, well, you know, just I just had to point that out. So they were uh, the original persecutors of uh, Christians. Of course, the original Christians were all Jews, and uh, uh, starting with the twelve apostles, well, eleven, one, one minus himself, Judas Iscariot, the traitor, uh, but. Uh, they were all Jews. At Pentecost, they were all Jews. All the converts at Pentecost, some 5,000, was it, or 10,000, were all Jews. Jews that believed in that Jesus was the Messiah. That's what Christians were. And then sometime later, lo and behold, God decided to call the Gentiles too. He had a bigger plan than just one small people. His plan of salvation that he promised starting in the Garden of Eden was for the entire world, for all the descendants of Adam, to fix the damage, not just for one little sliver of humanity, which has always been population frozen about where it is now. So he says this. Now let's go over to another scripture. Oh, let's see. Was, that, was there something else there? Let me take a look before I go on. Oh, yeah, the next verse. The next verse, verse 15. Who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. Now, this is a historical fact. It's not anti-Semitic to say the truth. The, the Jewish leadership, not all the Jews, not the common people who followed the Messiah, 
but the Jewish leadership and the Pharisees were the ones that had him crucified. They didn't do the deed themselves. They forced Pontius Pilate to do it, cajoled him, threatened him, blackmailed him in order to get him to do it, and had a rigged trial and a, a, a purchased mob of protesters. Crucify, crucify. That's what the scripture records. And there's nothing uh, particularly unique, unique about that in human history. I mean, this is the kind of thing people in positions of power often do, as we should all understand. This wasn't unique in this. It's just the, the, the unique thing is both the Pharisees and the, uh, the temple leaders, the pro high priest and his associates, the, um, what did they call them? I don't know at the moment. Uh, they knew that Jesus was at least a prophet of God, and probably the Messiah, and they knew that he had actually raised Lazarus from the dead after Lazarus had been dead for four days. Dead, dead. He goes to the tomb, tells him to roll away the stone, and then says, Lazarus, come forth, and he does. And they were shocked, but most people were amazed. But these people ran and told the, the authorities what Jesus had done, and they determined they had to get rid of this guy or everybody would follow him, and then they would lose their place because they owed their office to Rome. It was a matter of protecting their jobs. Are people like that today? Yes, they are. This is not unique. These are not exceptionally evil people. The only thing that was exceptionally evil about it is they knew who he was. They just cared more for their position than they did for the fact that the Messiah had come. And Satan, behind the scenes, of course, was working in all this and helping them to go in that direction, as he always does, just like who do you think it actually guides the president of the United States? Not his advisors, his master, the one who stands beside him or behind him with his hand on his shoulder or someplace else, who knows? He is a bit of, of a puppet. That's how Satan uses men. He's able to manipulate us very, very easily. Just... You know, we're, we're sinful by nature, and he knows our desires, and he promises, makes lying promises, and, and, and eventually he's able to control us very easily. You can become possessed, where you are driven to do things by evil spirits. You, you are not free. You're not unconscious, but you're not free, and you're not able to effectively resist like the demonic of the, of the gatherings. I know from personal experience many years ago. And then God saved me, like the demonic of the gatherings. All right, so in verse 15, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets in the Old Testament. Yeah, they did. God sent messengers, they'd kill them. No, but so would other people. This is not a uniquely Jewish problem. And have persecuted us, and they, did not, uh, they do not please God and are contrary or hostile, is another translation, to all men. Yep. And he's talking basically about the Pharisees and the religious leaders. He's not talking about all the Jewish people. The multitude followed him uh, freely. Uh, he was, many people followed him, especially people like tax collectors and prostitutes. Why? Because he had a message of salvation and they could not, they knew they could not be saved under the law of Moses. They knew they were damned. And Jesus said, believe in me and you've got eternal life. That's why they followed him and he would eat with them and talk with them. And he treated everybody as human beings, which is part of the problem that we ha we're, uh, I'm trying to communicate, which is a difficult subject, and, but it's important that we have an understanding 
of why what's going on in Israel, in Israel and why Israel is acting the way it does. In the sight of the whole world, they are, have become more and more vicious and open about it. Part of it's the times we're living in, uh, the end times when restraint has been removed and everything is basically showing itself for what it truly is, including the United States, which is the most warlike and dangerous nation on earth right now. Israel being a close second, mainly because it's joined at the hip to the United States. So, uh, again, and there's dark forces, spiritual forces, working behind the scenes to accomplish their purpose, which is to disrupt the kingdom of God and prevent the Messiah from coming, or to do as much damage as possible before he comes and they're locked away. So here, let's go to another portion. Again, Paul says they're, they're contrary to all men. Yeah, they are. I'm, in general, they can't get along with anyone. And that is the history, too. It is not simply because they've been persecuted all over that they've traveled, which is part of the curse of the law. If you don't keep the law, this is what's going to happen. And again, after 70 AD, they couldn't keep it. And rather than repent and believe in the Messiah, uh, they invented this, you know, decided, well, we're just going to go with the traditions of the Pharisees. Forget the temple because we can't practice the Torah anyway. So they made up their own system of religion, expanded the traditions of the elders, which are not from God. I just saw a rabbi on the internet that was claiming that, what was it? The Romans came from Ishmael? I think that he was saying that. No, Esau. He said the Romans were descendants of Esau. No. That does not come from the Bible. That comes from Jewish tradition. The Talmud. I believe, because it certainly doesn't come from the Bible. And rabbis aren't really big in the Bible. They're, they're in the Talmud. That's, that's their book. Or books, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, so here, let's go to another scripture that Paul explains more about this situation here that uh, was present at that time in the first century and continues today. Now, this is his uh, epistle, his letter to the Ephesians. I'm going to start at chapter two. The, the first two, two chapters in this letter are wonderful. And you, now he's talking to Gentiles, writing to Gentiles, and you he made alive, that is God, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, or is that world or age? Uh, world. Not that it really matters. They're almost interchangeable. According to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, the children of Adam, all the descendants of Adam. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all disobeyed. God set... Uh, put all humanity under sin for a reason, that he might show mercy to all. Among whom once we, now he's talking about the apostles plus, he's talking about the Jews, we once also, uh, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, the desires of the body, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So the Jews by nature are just as sinful as everybody else. Children of wrath, children of God's anger, or subject to God's anger. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in... Now he's talking about everybody now. When we were dead in trespasses made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show his, the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. 
it is the gift of God. The, that there is the entire phrase, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That's what the, that refers to. And not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You're not saved by works, you're saved by God's grace, by God's just giving you salvation that you receive uh, as a free gift through faith. God will give eternal life to every, everyone who will ask. Call upon Jesus Christ to save you, and you will receive the free gift of eternal life and all the benefits of the new covenant. You will be in the new covenant. It's by faith, not by birth, not by works, not by circumcision, not by baptism, not by efforts, not by works of devotion. It's by God's free gift that's received by faith in Christ. Not of works, verse 9, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh, therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called on circumcision by what is called circumcision, in other words, you are referred to as uncircumcised Gentiles by the Jews, the circumcision, he's referring to the Jews, because the mark of being a Jew is, uh, uh, well, sort of the mark of being a Jew. The, the males are all circumcised. Muslims are circumcised, too. So are most Gentiles. <laughs> but that's a different issue. No, but it, it was an ex For the Jews, Gentiles were uncircumcised, unclean, not marked of God, not chosen by God, not God's people according to their traditions, and the Old Testament. And Paul is going to deal with that right here. <laughs> who were once called, uh, were, were, who, you who are called on circumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, in other words, the work of man, literally, snip, <laughs> yeah, <sighs> cutting off the foreskin, that's what circumcision is. That at, uh, that at that time you were without Christ, be, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. This is people who don't have salvation in Christ. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, the Gentiles, the Gentiles in the Old Testament were far off. They didn't have the covenants. They didn't have hope. And they were without God. Not that utterly without God. God was there, but he was not their God. They did not have faith in God. They didn't know him at all. But the Jews did. They had the prophets. They had Moses. They had the revelation. They had the scriptures. So that they're, they were not without God, but even they were not saved by that. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ, or in the Old Testament, grace through faith. Circumcision was a sign given to Abraham that he was justified, right, we could say God, Abraham became right in God's sight, which is what justification means, you know, that you were right with God in a relational way, because he believed God. He believed God's promises, and therefore God regarded him as righteous because he believed him. And circumcision was given to him as a sign of that, that righteousness is by faith, and to his descendants as a reminder. That's how you're right with God. But that was perverted quickly into something else and forgotten, forgotten what the scriptures actually say. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, in the Messiah... You who were far off, Gentiles, unclean in the Old Testament, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. His death atoned for the sins not only of Jews, but the sins of the whole world. In Christ, you're reconciled to God. What you couldn't be reconciled uh, from in the Old Testament. You can, you're forgiven all things through faith in Christ. 
the Old Testament, only deliberate, uh, deliberate violations of the law were not forgivable. A, a, a sinful lifestyle, you know, you, how do you, you know, every time you sinned, you had to offer sacrifices. It, it was, it, the law did not save anyone. It just simply condemns you. It demonstrates you need a Savior. And if you believed that you were righteous through the law, you had deceived yourself because you, you ignored the great commandments to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Uh, those are commandments that we tend to break all the time. You know, you can, some commandments you can keep. Those you can't. And those are the core of the law. All the other commandments hang on those are supported by those. <laughs> For he himself, he himself, and I keep hammering on that, it's in Christ. It is not in an institution. It's not in a system of doctrine. It's not in religion. It's being in Christ in a relationship with him because he himself is our salvation. He himself is our peace who made both one, made the both one, the both what? The Jew and the Gentiles one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. There was a wall in the temple that um, uh, the uncircumcised, those who are not part of God's covenant, could not go past. Only the Jews, who were keepers of the covenant, could enter in, and even then, only the men could go through the next wall. So the middle wall was that separated the Gentiles who might be there worshiping Yahweh from the Jews who were there worshiping Yahweh. They could only approach so far. They could not come in and offer sacrifices. So they were not um, true. They were not part of the covenant of Moses having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the hostility, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances. He fulfilled the law, paid the penalty of the law on the cross. The law of Moses is abolished. It is obsolete. He did not destroy it. He fulfilled it and inherited the blessings, paid the penalty because he did not sin, he received the, the, uh, the blessings of the law and paid the penalty of the law, which is death the, for disobedience, by dying as an innocent man in our place. So that to create in himself, again, it's in Christ, one new man from the two, thus making peace. There is no Jew nor Gentile in Jesus Christ. There is no ethnic identity in Christ. There is not even male or female in Christ. We are all utterly equal in him. All humanity is equal in him. He abolished that hostility. He abolished the distinctions between Jews and Gentiles. He came, and he came and preached peace to you who are afar off, again, the Gentiles, and to those who were near, the Jews. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being uh, the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being joined together into a holy temple of the Lord. In whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. This is that we are the true temple. Those who believe in the Messiah are the true temple. Whether We're no longer Gentiles and Jews. That difference has been abolished. So that is the biblical Christian position. If you are a Christian and have a different position, you're wrong. You're just plain wrong. Dispensationalism does not recognize this, refuses to recognize the teachings of the Scripture for their own traditions, which go back to Darby and Schofield and some other people. 
Uh, so they're they're much they're really like the Pharisees that went to an oral law rather than God's written law. So here here's the problem today, and again this is not uniquely a Jewish issue, but it is certainly manifesting itself in what we see today in Israel uh, and the relationship with the people of Gaza, for example. The whole attitude over there. Here's the problem. It is Zionism. This is the problem. Uh, or as the founder, Theodore Herzl, uh, said, he wrote a pamphlet in 19, 1896 called Der Judenstaat, the Jewish state. Der Judenstaat. Yeah, so here's the problem. If, if the people of Israel simply wanted a place they could live in peace, that's one thing. If they want a place to themselves, where they're special and separate from the rest, we're the Jews, we are the chosen people, we are the, the, the only ones that are important, everybody else is less than us, like lesser human beings, just the way a certain uh, ideology in Europe in the 1940s and 30s uh, instructed the German people that they were the master race and others, particularly Slavs and Jews and Gypsies and others were subhuman, just like the Japanese treated the Chinese and the Koreans at that same time in the East with the same kind of ideology that they were a superior people, a superior race. Just like the Ku Klux Klan in the United States, white supremacists who often use Christian symbols but are utterly anti-Christ. So here's, here's the issue, why Israel is continually at war continually at war, because they will not live in peace with anybody else. They are contrary to all men, hostile toward others. They are hostile toward non-Jews. At least some of them are. And right now the leadership in Israel is that way. And historically, Herzl here, see that the issue is here. It's right here. It says, this is Wikipedia. So, you know, as, which, take it or leave it. Uh, I mean, what what did uh, Musk offered to give them a billion dollars just to change their name for thirty days? <laughs> he doesn't think highly of it. Apparently, for most purposes, it's useful. Just realize it may have a bias to it, uh, a conformist bias. Uh, Zionism is a nationalist movement. See, this sets it aside from a lot of things. A national identity movement. A Judenstaat. A Jewish state. That emerged in the 19th century to enable the establishment of a homeland for the Jews, for the Jewish people in Palestine, which was already inhabited and had been for almost two millennia by other peoples, including some indigenous Jews a region roughly corresponding to the land of Israel in the Jewish tradition, uh, or the Bible. <sighs> Following the establishment of Israel, Zionism became an ideology that supports the development and protection of the state of Israel. Okay, so th this is the problem with this. It is not a place for Jews to live in peace. It is a place for Jews to live as a separate people. Sort of the Old Testament concept of we are the chosen ones. We alone are the chosen ones. Everybody else is mere Gentiles. They are not God's chosen people. So it's, it, it is this continuation of a, this superior attitude. It's a, it's a supremacist movement a Jewish supremacist movement. There's a bit of that in Islam, but it's not a... Uh, Islam doesn't identify with a particular people. 
So this is much more like a white supremacist movement kind of thing, where you believe that the or the, uh, you're, that you're because you're of the Aryan, so-called Aryans, whatever they are, uh, that you're better than everybody else. Everybody else is lesser creatures. And again, there's a problem with this in the Quran when it refers in one section to the, the Jews as monkeys and pigs. So there's, there's problems in the Quran, uh, especially when it regards to Jews in the last days. So there's, there needs to be a little uh, adjustment there, I think. Uh, maybe more than that. See, in Christ, in Jesus Christ, it, it, see, racism has absolutely zero place in Christianity. If there are people that, that are racist and they're Christians, they're not Christians. They're not. They're not following Christ. They're not following the teaching of the Bible at all, uh, <laughs> uh, which has been a problem in the United States. Christians that don't follow the Bible at all, they don't follow Christ. So they're, they're just nominally Christians. There's a lot of religions that have problems with nominal believers. They're not serious about it. Uh, Islam has the same problems. So here, this is, again, this is a uh, sort of, a, they claim it's a reaction to some of the anti-Semitism. But the anti-Semitism is also, in part at least, a reaction to the, the, the attitude that's present in the Talmud, where Jews are a separatist, uh, they're a separatist people, they keep to themselves, and they tend to look down on Gentiles as unclean. It's a fact. And Christians have sometimes looked down on Gentiles as murderers of the Messiah, depending on the priests sometimes rile people up. Those were Roman Catholics. Uh, you never have been persecuted by Baptists. You've never been persecuted by evangelicals. The worst thing we do is try to get you saved, get you to believe in the Messiah. That, that, that is not a crime, except in Israel. It's a crime. And they were trying to impose sentences on people for it, but they decided, nah, Netanyahu didn't allow that to go through because he didn't want to alienate the uh, cr the Christians in America that tend to be supporters of Israel in their ignorance and in their... United States evangelicals have been so corrupted by dispensationalism, it's ridiculous. Again, the Bible does not allow that kind of thing. The, the Bible does not denigrate Jews. Paul... Paul talks about his desire that if it would be possible, he'd be willing to lay down his life for his countrymen. He's, it pains him to see them not believe in the Messiah God had sent them. Uh, but it, it, Christianity is not anti-Jewish people. It is simply, you know, our, our desire is to see, as God's desire is to see all men saved. God has not cut off the Jews forever. The door is always wide open. You just have to believe in the Messiah. Call out to him, the Messiah who has already come, Jesus Christ, or Yeshua HaMashiach. You, know. you don't have to use the English name. God knows who you're talking to and knows your heart. So you have to truly do it. You have to wish to be saved from your sin. And you don't have a atoning sacrifice under Judaism, do you? You don't have a true atonement at all anymore because the atonement God gave you has already come. It's already complete. It's already done. You don't need to offer sacrifices. Christ, God himself in the flesh, offered himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the entire world. You don't need to build that dumb temple. It's obsolete. And God will never accept your offerings. They'll be an abomination. So this is this is where the problem is. It's it is the the exclusivity of Zionism and of Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, that you're this this small chosen people, and everybody else is less than you because they're not Jews. the The Palestinians 
are interned in Gaza and being destroyed for what crime? For not being Jews. The Palestinians that are being shot by settlers and the police and the army on the West Bank currently for the crime of not being Jews. They are exiles in their own land for not being Jews. That's the problem. Zionism is the problem. Trying to have a homeland for yourselves alone. Not a country where you can live in peace, but your own country. Nationalism. Jewish nationalism. The desire for a Judenstadt. That's the problem. And the Talmud. That's the problem. I'm aware of some of the things the Talmud says that are absolutely despicable from a Christian point of view. If a Christian did some of those things, they would be, well, worthy of hell, for sure. Just an attitude toward others that are different. Christians ought never have such an attitude toward anyone. It's forbidden. It's forbidden. God does not have an attitude like that present in the Talmud. It's not the only problem with the Talmud. There's an attitude that the rabbis could pull a fast one on God with their ways around their so-called commandments. Like especially um, hiring a, a Gentile to turn your lights on and off. Those kind of traditions. Of course, that doesn't apply directly to, say, the 10th century, but the same idea. I mean, it's developed out of that. You have a tradition that, you, because you can't do any, the, the scripture says laborious work on the Sabbath, that somehow turning electric light, uh, it said you can't kindle a fire, and that got transmuted by uh, the rabbis into you can't turn electric lights on and off on the Sabbath. Is it laborious work, like kindling a fire? No, it's not. But they don't understand the scripture. So they invent this rule that you can't turn the lights on or off on the Sabbath, and that because that becomes very inconvenient. Then they prevent, uh, come up with another rule that says you can hire a Gentile neighbor, a boy or something, to do it for you, but you can't actually pay him to do it, but you can promise that he'll, you know, if you do this for me, I'll probably give you a reward. <laughs> I'll do something for you. You know, you're not actually hiring him. You're just promising something that's not quite hiring in order to get around the very commandment you created that was supposed to protect the commandment not to kindle a fire, not to perform laborious work on the Sabbath. That's a very basic example of what you find in the Talmud. Do you think God is fooled? Do you think God is fooled by your chicanery? You can't deceive God. God looks on the heart. Not on the outside. He looks on the heart. He knows your heart. You can't escape God. The only way to escape God's judgment is to believe in the Messiah the one atonement for sin, the sufficient atonement for sin. So that really lays at the bottom of this. Again, there's, there's elements in Islam that contribute it, to it too uh, on the other side. So you've got these two. So what happens when an irresistible force moves, meets an immovable object? Nothing good. <laughs> the end of reality? Yeah, uh, this is... Uh, of course, that puzzle is simply foolish because there's no such thing as an irresistible force or a movable object. Philosophers and their silliness. But uh, there's only God. Everything else is his creation. So this is, this is at the root of the problem. This is why we see this, this absolute indifference to the death of Palestinians. 
because Jews are one thing, everybody else is something less, which is very close to the ideology that arose in Germany and or Austria in the last century. This racial supremacist, again, it's not quite racial, but that was racial. The, 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 well, of course, it was an imaginary race, too, the Aryan race, whatever that was. There's only one human race. And uh, in, within the, the Jewish people, the, the, those that God had called out of Egypt, there was more than just Jews, including one of King David's ancestors was, let's see, he had Ruth, the Moabitess, and there was, uh, uh, who was the woman at Jericho? The prostitute, the ancestor of David, the prostitute at Jericho. She wasn't Jewish either, but she was an ancestor of David the king and the Messiah. That's where the answer is in Jesus Christ. He breaks down that barrier, that middle dividing wall. It's gone in him. There is no Jew or Greek or Gentile. Scythian or barbarian, male or female in Christ. It's gone. None of those identities survive. We become one new person in him. One new man, a new race, so to speak. The race of the twice-born, those who are born again of his spirit. But as long as you have this ideology of Zionism and a the superior attitude that's present in the Talmud, which does come from the Old Testament law. Again, the Old Testament law has been extinguished, or I shouldn't say extinguished, fulfilled, fulfilled. Uh, even then, it didn't, that was not the real attitude. It, the separate, separation was to protect God's people from contamination by idols. It's not because the Jews were any better. In fact, God says it, the, very, the opposite. You were the least of people. I chose you not because you were mighty, but because you were the least. You were nothing. God does not choose the mighty very often, or the rich, or the powerful, or the wise. He chooses the foolish and the weak and the things that are of no importance in order to put the world to shame. He chooses people like me. There, there's no place for boasting in Christ. None at all. No place for superiority because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Whether No matter what you are, you've already sinned. Only in Christ is there forgiveness of all those sins. And as long as Israel seeks to have a Judenstadt, for the Jews alone. See, that's the problem. It's not a, it's, they're not seeking a, a place where all can live together in peace. They're seeking an exclusive Judenstadt, an exclusively Jewish state, where the Jews are privileged, where they express their convictions of privilege openly and legally, that's the problem. Where they feel free to steal the land of others and to persecute others and to murder others in order to steal their land and remove them from their Judenstadt. That's the problem. And how do you deal with that? You can't fix that and maintain Zionism and the Talmud. The problem is inherent. The Talmud does not come from God, nor does Zionism come from God. It comes from men. It is human tradition. It's a form of, of, I don't know how, you can't say racist, but identity superiority. Identity supremacy. 
The Jewish identity must be supreme in the Judenstaat. Contrary to all men, they maintain the middle dividing wall. Gentiles not appreciated. Gentiles get out. That's what they're doing. So they think they can suppress, they can eliminate Hamas? No, you can't. You cannot eliminate resistance to your Judenstadt. And that's what it is. It's resistance to the Judenstadt, which they have imposed on land that belonged to others. So of course there's going to be resistance, unless you wipe them all out. Is that what you're doing? Destroying them all? Well, there's others. There's others that don't live in Gaza. There's others that live in the nations around there that were driven out too. And then there's the whole world that sees what you're doing and is beginning to realize what you are. <clears throat> and the Judenstadt is supposed to be a place where you don't experience persecution. You'll have the whole world against you. They just about are now. The American people will turn against you too because they're seeing these images. News coverage has already begun to change. It's no longer about October 7th and all the propaganda that were put, it, put out about beheaded babies and other lies that were circulated that not even the Israeli military would confirm. 40 beheaded, beheaded babies? That was a lie made up by a settler. A Jewish settler. In other words, an illegal occupier of stolen lands with an Israeli uniform on claiming he saw these things, and he's the only one that claimed it, and it spread far and wide. Well, the truth does come out, you know. Repeated by Netanyahu on the phone to Joe Biden. By your own media. This is not how you make friends. This is not how you get along with neighbors. If you desire peace, you can't have your Juden stock. You have to be able to live with other people. And it would be good practice to try to learn to live with other people. Zionism is a problem. And the attitude that underlies it. The supremacist attitude that underlies Zionism among many Jews. Again, I want to be careful not to say all Jews, because I know it's not true, truly the attitude of all. But it is the attitude of the leadership in Israel right now, the attitude of those that are destroying the Palestinians indiscriminately. When you're trying to starve and deprive a population of water and all the necessity of life, you are trying to kill them. This is murder, plain murder. This is genocide. This is a huge atrocity that Israel is committing right now in the eyes of the world, not hidden away in some camp, in front of the entire world. And you think there's not going to be blowback? May God give you the wisdom to repent before it's too late, or there will be another Holocaust. And you're lighting the fires yourself. Fires of hatred and supremacy toward others, not treating others as human beings, of equal human beings. We are all uh, children of Adam. There is no superior race. There is no longer a chosen people based on, there never was a chosen people based on physical descent. You had to keep the covenant to be in God's people even in the Old Testament, are the law of Moses. If you did not keep the covenant, you were cut off. Well, you don't keep the covenant today. God created a new covenant in Christ. He purchased it with his own blood. It's promised to you in Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31. It's received by faith in the Messiah. It's his covenant, the eternal covenant. You'll find peace there. 
You will never find peace in your Judenstadt.